Whitmar from the University of California, Berkeley. And the paper he has chosen to speak to us about is a much discussed theme, India, China, and the United States strategic choices. I'm delighted also to be able to welcome Dr. Alan Bollard, director of APEC, and so many other friends, and the High Commissioner of Pakistan, and uh, many other dignitaries. Um, I have uh, great joy in uh, sharing with you a very unusual person, because in our line of work, either you excel in area studies or you excel in a basic discipline. To be able to do both is not easy. Professor Dietmar has done it, which is why he's the editor of Asian Survey and the author of a number of very well-received books. From the area side, South Asia's Nuclear Security Dilemma, India, Pakistan, and China, uh, 2005. That's uh, one of the many area books. And most recently, the handbook of Rutledge Handbook of Chinese Security. There are a string of others. I'll tell you how um, we, um, when I say we, I mean Jivanta Shatli and I, we were then in Heidelberg, um, located uh, Professor Dietmar. We were asked by Rutledge to identify the 100 best articles on South Asia for a Rutledge, they call it a major work, Modern Politics of South Asia. So I was asked. Uh, to put these things together. And the more I thought about it, the more I asked myself, is there a modern politics of South Asia? That was before Modi. Is there a modern politics of South Asia? Is there a modern politics of South Asia? Is there a modern politics of South Asia? Five ways of asking this question, five contested concepts, became five books. And one of the lead articles here was written by Professor Lowell Dietmar. It was called South Asia's Security Dilemma. As you can see, uh, dilemmas have been a favorite theme. And today, uh, Singapore also has a dilemma, which you to look. I think we all have dilemmas. But we will hear a lot more about it from Professor Lowell Dietmar. He will uh, speak for about uh, 45 minutes. We'll have a general question answer session. After that, there will be an opportunity to engage him further, because he's not doing a fly by night. He is actually based in Singapore at the moment. So there will be an opportunity to engage him today, as well as during the rest of his uh, tenure here in Singapore. Noel, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor to be here, and I thank you for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Uh, there's an English saying, I think, uh, carrying coals to Newcastle. And uh, I feel like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle, as of course the meaning is that uh, I'm bringing something that you already have plenty of, which is knowledge about South Asia. Uh, and you probably, many people here know much more about South Asia than I do, and I am very conscious of that. And so I will present my uh, findings with all due modesty, and I look forward to your comments and criticisms at the end, and I'll save plenty of time for that. Okay, uh, oh, by the way, Newcastle was carrying coals to Newcastle. It was, it was called that because Newcastle was the leading coal exporter in a place in England at that time in the 19th century. But Newcastle today is still the leading coal exporter in the world, except it's Newcastle in Australia. So, <laughs> so things change and stay the same. OK, um, this is what the outline of my presentation, the f very uh, very standard. Uh, first, the chronology of development. I'll go through the uh, development of uh, China-India relations, which are uh, familiar to many of you already. Second, uh, focus on the security relations between India and China. Third, the economic relations between India and China. And finally, uh, the triangular analysis of the relations between China, India, and the United States, and uh, Pakistan. <laughs> Uh, so this is the historic contacts. Uh, there have been religious exchanges. Uh, Mahabharata uh, in 500 BC uh, referred already to China. And uh, uh, Bodhidharma in 400 uh, after, after Christ uh, visited China, of course, from, uh, from India, carrying Buddhism with him. The Silk Road 
in 700, about 700 in the in the uh, Tang, and 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 of course that was the founder of the so-called uh, Silk Road Economic Belt that China is trying to renew after about uh, what over a thousand years, uh, and the uh, Maritime Silk Road was pioneered by Zhang He, the famous admiral, uh, eunuch from during the uh, Ming Dynasty, uh, before China shut off all uh, maritime commerce with the world uh, and uh, turned inward. And of course, uh, British China, India, uh, after the British took over India, uh, India grew and exported opium to China as a cash crop, uh, causing uh, all sorts of damage that was blamed not on India, however, but on England, fortunately. And in 1950, of course, uh, India was the second country, second non-communist country in the world to recognize China. And uh, Nehru placed a great deal of hope in establishing a very, very friendly relationship with China, that China and India together would constitute resurgent Asia and become the heart of the of the non-aligned bloc in the world, uh, leaning neither towards the Western or, or the uh, communist camp, uh, finding their own way. And uh, this was a cherished ideal in, incorporated into the uh, Panchila, uh, which as you know, the five principles of peaceful coexistence was agreed between Nehru and Zhou Enlai, I think in 1954 uh, at first, and that became part of the Chinese constitution actually, it was sometimes ignored, but uh, it was part of the Chinese constitution also, the, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, and it's been re reiterated by the Chinese leadership ever since 1954 uh, in a ritual fashion. Uh, in 1950, Tibet was invaded by China, but it left fairly autonomous at that time in 1950. Uh, but in 1959, the, there was a rebellion in Tibet and the Chinese cracked down with the PLA. And the, there's a mass migration, of course, of the uh, Dalai Lama and uh, several hundred thousand Tibetans from I Tibet to India where they were settled in Dharamsala. Uh, Nehru chose that spot because they couldn't abide the heat apparently and he put them in the mountains uh, where they were uh, more comfortable living there and they've been living there ever since. And that was the beginning of the bone of contention between India and China, of course. Uh, the the, har the uh, harboring of these refugees, these Tibetan refugees, in India, which obviously seemed to take the side of Tibet uh, and to constitute an alternative government of Tibet, uh, sort of out, uh, sort of, which has indeed become an exile government in Dharamsala, and of course the Dalai, Dalai, Sala, uh, Dalai Lama continues to uh, navigate the world. He does not, uh, contrary to Chinese uh, accusations, advocate. Uh, uh, Tibetan independence, uh, but he does advocate a more autonomous Tibet than uh, exists at the present time, and that's basically uh, something that Chinese does not want to accept. Uh, they've given Hong Kong more autonomy, and actually Tibet applied once to become a special administrative region the way Hong Kong is a special administrative region. In other words, give us the same autonomy that you have to... But the, but the autonomous regions in China, the five autonomous regions are given much less autonomy than the uh, than the special administrative region in Hong Kong. So that is the 1959 caused the border sp first border spat, a small patrol in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, the Oxai Jin region in the w in the uh, western part of uh, India uh, on the border with China. A uh, small patrol in 1959 went and discovered a road that the uh, Chinese had been building between Xinjiang and the uh, and the uh, uh, and Tibet, and uh, they uh, they this road had been built in secret since 1957, and uh, the Chinese ambushed the uh, soldiers who detected the road and caused a few casualties. That was a very very small incident but it betokened the sort of sensitivity of the issue. Uh, and in 1962, of course, the, uh, this is the, this is a, a game of 
chess, a Chinese chess, and it was apparently invented in India, or the ancestor of this game was invented in India back in about 600 BC, B BCE. Uh, I can't remember the Indian name. You probably know the Indian name, but anyway, it's the ancestor of both the Chinese chess, not not uh, the type that what we what the Japanese call Go, but Sha uh, Chi, a Chinese type of chess, and also Western chess, and it came from India apparently. So that's a <laughs> India has the pride of having originated this type of uh, game. Uh, one of the one of the things that spread from India to China, and this is a sort of uh, this is a, a picture in 1954 uh, of the uh, uh, of a hall in Beijing this is in Beijing uh, where who is that that looks like looks like Liu Shaoqi I'm not sure anyway these, um, a meeting between India and, and China uh, this is uh, so the second era is the Gandhian era the first era was the Nehruvian era and the second era is the Gandhian era from 1962 to 1991 and it started with the border war, and it was the absolute uh, worst period of India-China relations, of course. Uh, the war in which India lost, uh, they sent a patrol in and were ambushed, and the Chinese, it was a very short war. The Chinese took the territory that they considered theirs and then withdrew about 12 miles behind the territory that they took. And, uh, and uh, the after that, there was a quite a vicious polemic against Nehru, who was considered a he had betrayed China. He was blamed for the flight of the Dalai Lama. He was blamed for uh, the, the the deterioration of relations between the two, and that has been a an enduring problem between India and China ever since. Uh, and it, the border has remained troubled. There were serious incidents in. Uh, the Natula incident and the Chola in 1967 and in 1987-88 the uh, no excuse me, the Natula incident in 1967 and the Chola incidents in 19 uh, later I think I think they were both in 1967 excuse me 1967 the Chola incident and the Natula incident 1971 uh, Indo-Pakistan war of course over uh, the secession of Bangladesh uh, in this war, the U.S. supported Pakistan, and uh, Russia supported, and China, suppo China supported Pakistan. China and the U.S. supported Pakistan. So that was a coalition, U.S., China, and Pakistan against India. India in 1971, thus, and it was not coincidental, I think, formed a friendship treaty with Russia, with the Soviet Union. And so that set up this uh, opposition between the United States also and India, because India was considered a proxy of the Soviet Union in South Asia, and it c created a strong bound bi bi bond <laughs> between uh, the United States and Pakistan, the f uh, non-NATO ally, the closest non-NATO ally of the United States, accor according to uh, as it was put at the time. So in 1979, uh, finally they restored diplomatic. So after 1976 or so, gradual warming of relationships. 1979, restoration of diplomatic ties. 1981-87, eight uh, border talks held. 1987-88, another Sino-Indian Sino skirmish. Uh, so there were three basic armed incidents. One in 1967, one in 1962, the second in 1967, and one in 1988 uh, between India and China, uh, making this a blood debt as far as India is concerned. 1988, however, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, he was not really the first, but he was the most influential perhaps in restoring relations between India and China. He went to Beijing had talks, and after that they decided to have annual talks on the border. And this is the border incident display. This is uh, this is uh, Sundaram Chu. I, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Correct, <laughs> Sundaram Chu, which is on the uh, eastern part of the border between China and India. And this has remained very sensitive. This is the site of the skirmish, I think, in 1988. 
And this, it, so contemporary relations from 1991 to the present. Uh, 1992, Li Peng went to Delhi, joint working group established on border agreement. In 1998, India, Pakistan had nuclear tests. And this sent uh, China, India relations into a nosedive, of course, because uh, this, uh, the foreign minister Fernandez, George Fernandez, blamed the nuclear tests, the n need to have nuclear weapons on China. He said, we have the number one enemy of India has nuclear weapons, and we have to provide, we have to have nuclear weapons to de defend ourselves, it's a defense. So that was in 1998, so that created a, uh, a bitter, that aggravated the relationship between India and China. Uh, but it was only, uh, it, it did not last very long. In 1999, during the Kargil War between India and Pakistan, China played a fairly um, helpful role uh, because it did not, it supported Pakistan, but it urged Pakistan at the same time to withdraw. So gradually, China has, um, tried to move away from uh, its, uh, tried to become more balanced in its relationship to South Asia, I think. At least during this period, it was trying to be more balanced and to be pro-Pakistan and pro-India at, at the same time. And, and they were perhaps somewhat helpful in Cargill. Uh, 19, in 2005, China became an observer in the South Asian uh, Association for Regional uh, Cooperation. 2010, both entered the BRICS uh, and the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And uh, in 2006, the Natula Pass was opened. And so, in, in finally, in 2017, India and Pakistan joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, where they are they met for the first time in the Shanghai Cooperation Organ Organization. When was that? Just recently, right? I mean, when it was just a, a month or so ago in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting. So this is the, uh, what is this? This is the Cargill uh, affray uh, in the Shachen Glacier region uh, up in uh, the Kar uh, Kashmir, I think, in Kashmir in the Cargill attack by Ka Pakistan. Uh, so security relations. I think that there are three basic issues between India and China. One is the asymmetric balance of forces between them, uh, and the second is the proxy logic of mutual encirclements, that they try to encircle each other strategically. And uh, I think that both are guilty of this, of the um, encirclement and counter-encirclement. -encir and finally, uh, the maritime contest, which is part of this encirclement campaign this of, 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 of China. Okay, the asymmetric balance. The underlying problem for India, of course, is that China is bigger than India. Uh, the land area of China is about three times the size of India, although it has about the same population now. Uh, almost, uh, some people claim that India now has a larger population than China, That's actually, so they're very close. But by 2030, I think the estimates were that the India will have a larger population than China. Uh, so they are bigger than India, and for about the last, since 1978, they have grown faster than China. They've grown about nearly 10 percent per year from 1978 up to the present. And uh, whereas India started its reform later, about 10 years later, and it has grown about 7 percent per year, averaging about 7 percent per year uh, from 19. 91 up till uh, 2015, uh, about 7% per year. Now, for the last three years, from 2015 to 2018, uh, India has grown faster than China, I think, as according to the statistics that I've seen. So that may be, uh, and China has declined, this, China's growth rate has, of course, declined. So it's not, it's China, India is growing at about 8% now, and China is growing about, last year grew about 6.5%. So, I mean, so that that may be changing, but still, uh, in terms of GDP, in terms of size of the economy, as far as I know, uh, China is about four times as large as India's economy as GDP. So that provides a larger tax base 
to spend on money, uh, excuse me, spend on arms, spend on military budget. And I think uh, China's arms budget is about three times as large as India's arms budget. Now it's hard to measure the Chinese arms budget. Maybe it's true in all countries because the arms Chinese don't count the same things in their arms budget. But as uh, that's according to Stockholm Institute for International S Studies, their their estimates, which is a fairly conservative estimate. So uh, about three times as much of an arms budget. And so if we compare, this is the GDP growth of uh, since 19. Uh, 80, I think it was. I think it's not very clear, is it? Uh, I think it's 1980. It's supposed to be 1980. Uh, that didn't come out very clear. Anyway, so you can see that it, uh, China has been growing faster than India. Uh, up until 1988, they were about the same. From 1950, they started out about the same, and India may have even been a, ahead of China. Uh, but since 1978, uh, China has definitely out, out distance. India up till the present. So this is how they stack up in terms of arms. Uh, India and China. So I China has a, a basic superior in most respects in terms of conventional arms as well as in nuclear arms. But India does have a reliable um, deterrent capability, a hard, hard deterrent capability. Uh, India has now a ICBM that can hit any city in China. So and it has a it has developed a three pronged uh, nuclear deterrent that is submarines, uh, uh, bombers, uh, and uh, missiles that can hit China. This this, this triad uh, gives a, a, a guarantee that they even if they're struck first by a nuclear wep nuclear weapons they can they can strike back with a crippling blow. Uh, so although the India is probably inferior to China in most respects, the, they both have one of the largest standing armies in the world. Uh, India also has a, over a million people under arms, but China slightly larger. Lindy, India actually has a larger reserve force uh, than China. Uh, China has more active duty soldiers, but India has a larger reserve force. And uh, ballistic and tanks and so forth, this is this is uh, more on the uh, comparative armaments of India and China. Uh, actually, India is a bigger importer of weapons than Ch than China uh, today. In the since 2007, I think since 2007, India has been a larger importer of arms and. Up until last year, I think it was, most of the arms came from, as you know, this Russia, right? Uh, Russia and I think since 2015, I think it is, China, India is buying more weapons from the United States than they buy from Russia. From Russia. So uh, anyway, India has been importing more from more arms than China since 2007, basically because it, China stopped. Uh, importing so many arms, and because they had copied a lot of arms from uh, from Russia, uh, a number of their high, their jets, for example, are c copies from Russia. So they produce their own arms. They have they now recently they've had to go back and get engines from Russia and things other specialized equipment that they can't really make too well themselves. So they're still dependent on Russia for uh, some things, and they've they they recently bought some Su-35s from Russia, the most advanced. So on the one hand, Russia's dropped its threshold. They didn't want to, previously they didn't want to sell uh, China arms that might be used against them, because there's still a certain suspicion of Russia and China. They were enemies in the past, and they don't know exactly. So Russia's dropped its threshold and is willing to sell a top level arms to China, so, so Su-35s, and China is willing to uh, to buy them, I mean, it can't can't manufacture these things satisfactorily. By anyway, so that's the reason. Basically, in 2007, China stopped buying arms because they were manufacturing them all 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 by themselves. This is shows how sensitive and tense the relationship is between them. This is uh, an incident that happened in 2012, and some Indian planes uh, took off to. Uh, 
to uh, combat a scare in the sky and they came close to firing at each other, Indian and Chinese planes. So still the border, still basically a border, about the border issue and still it remains. I'm sorry that this didn't turn out very clearly. You can't read it uh, except for the headline. But anyway, that was in two, October 2012. So, uh, and finally the third issue is this maritime issue. Uh, India's become more and more concerned about what has been called the, uh, what is it, the uh, necklace, the, what is it, the uh, necklace of pearls? Yes. Uh, what is it? Uh, string of pearls. Uh, string of pearls, yes. yeah. Uh, and of course this is a totally um, bogus uh, metaphor beca because the Chinese never used it. Actually it was used by some Westerner, but it's caught on, so uh, I don't know if everybody uses string of pearls. But basically what it refers to is China's attempt to build a bunch of bases on its way to the Middle East. So it antedates and sort of precedes the uh, uh, Silk Road, uh, Silk Road Maritime Silk Road that uh, China has since launched in 2013. Uh, as you can see, uh, China then has in Chittagong, in uh, in uh, uh, Bangladesh, and in what is it? in uh, Sitwe, in Myanmar and in uh, Hambantota, in Sri Lanka, the, is building these, these ports. And China insists that these ports are all uh, commercial ports. And I think they are commercial ports. Uh, but China has also used the ports occasionally to dock their submarines. Uh, for example, they've docked, ports, docked their submarines in Colombo port. And so China, uh, expecting the worst, of course, I mean India expecting the worst, thinks that Gwadar is going to be a strategic port for Chinese naval vessels as well. So they're very nervous about this. India has been uh, doing the same thing, trying to counter China, and they've built uh, their own ports, as you can see, uh, see here, uh, Fort Blair in the Andaman Islands, and uh, uh, other places. And India has also been collaborating with Vietnam in the South China Sea. Uh, so India has stirred up trouble in the South China Sea. It's also raised the South China Sea issue in various multilateral forums, which China does not appreciate. Uh, China doesn't want anybody to talk about the ruling in uh, last year, 2016, of July 2016, by the Permanent Court of Arbitration on the Philippine case that said that the China was wrong and that they, they didn't really have a, 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 a valid claim to the South China Sea. And India has raised that, Modi has raised that in various multi multilateral forums and that China doesn't appreciate that. So that's the sort of, uh, basically it's a border issue, but it has expanded to include the proxy issue, uh, China's relationship first and foremost with Pakistan, uh, about 70% of the conventional weapons in Pakistan come from China and 90% of the missile parts and technology comes from China. So, uh, and a good share of the nuclear technology in Pakistan comes from China. So that's certainly the number one proxy. But China has cultivated relations also with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and other, I think those are the main main uh, neighbors of India to sort of build a circle, to encircle India as, as India sees it. And um, so India has attempted to counter that by forming close relations with Japan and with uh, Australia. They've tried to build relations with Australia and Japan and they've even opened a Taiwan club of some sort to, to have economic relations with Taiwan. Taiwan's not going to be much good to them in terms of any sort of strategic rationale. But So that is the nature of the strategic uh, China is using proxies. China, the trade between these proxies and China is larger than it is with 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 China is larger than it is with India. Uh, Bangladesh has a very, very robust trade with China. So does Pakistan. Pakistan, of course, is uh, the main link in South Asia in the Silk Road Silk Road Maritime Route, and. Uh, 
uh, Sri Lanka uh, is an interesting case because they have become deeply indebted to China and they're indebted, they're dependent on China whether they like it or not. Basically, Sri Lanka has billions of dollars in debt that they contracted to China during their civil war against the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil, Tamil Elam. So the that's the that's the security relations. Security, so trade has become securitized to some extent. And uh, okay, economic relations. China, econ, India trade was neg negligible until recently, but it's picked up and grown very rapidly since 1990. They have about 70 billion dollars worth of trade in 2016, such as that's a lot of trade. They aim. One job Bao said that they're aiming for 100 billion by the end of the decade. And there's a good chance that they'll meet that. The problem is that the trade is very, two, two problems with the trade. One is that it's very imbalanced. Uh, in 2016, about, uh, China sold about $61 billion worth of goods to India. India sold about $9 billion worth of uh, goods to China. So it's very imbalanced. And second problem is it's uh, neocolonial in nature. In other words, the, what India sells to China is basically raw materials, and what China sells to India is high-tech stuff, I mean, higher-tech higher stuff. So it's, uh, it doesn't give China, India much of a chance to develop its export-oriented growth, export development. Uh, that's the trade. This is bilateral trade volume, so it's constantly going up since 2006. Uh, huge trade imbalance and so forth. And uh, what does this show? It shows that uh, China's India, China, well, shows that India, China's, India is growing faster lately in the last three years, uh, somewhat making up. Modi's putting very strong emphasis, very strong focus on growth. And so far, I think he's been quite successful. Uh, but I, I rely on you to fill me in on that because you probably know much more about India's economy than I do. So these are some of Chinese characters. I want to, uh, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my time. I'm just, skip this is the obvious importance of trade. Trade, is, chi trade has been uh, a weak point in India's development, I think. It's not a mercantilist success story for India. It's been, up until Modi, I think it's been one of the least open economies in the world. Uh, they blame that on the bureau bureaucratic uh, pedophagy and so forth. I don't know, but uh, it has not been open. But I think uh, Modi is trying very hard to open India up. I think that's one of his major uh, focuses in his uh, in his policy. And I think he's he's made he, he made a very early trip to the United States to cultivate the Indian diaspora, and he's been uh, trying to do that. But up to now, it hasn't been a great success. China is the true mercantilist, and that's been the story of their success story. They, the export-oriented growth strategy that was used by the NICs, the newly industrialized countries, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, and uh, what is it, Hong Kong have been used by China with a much larger economy, and it's been spectacularly successful in cultivating the export-oriented growth. So, and China is falling behind in terms of population growth, if you think that's an asset to have a large population. And, uh, but China's population growth, population growth control strategy will put it in a bind coming up because it's had a sudden decline in population growth that will create a situation in which their, the working age population will have to support a larger and larger uh, What's, what's the term? Uh, larger and larger group of older and younger people. So the working age population will shrink thanks to the very successful birth control policy put into effect uh, around 1980, I think it was. And so they'll face this problem of having a, uh, and India will not have that problem because they've never had a very successful birth control policy. The, Indira Gandhi tried it. She found it was not very popular, and so she had to stop. So they won't, they won't, India won't be faced with that problem, that particular problem of having. Uh, so 
we get to the tri uh, triangular analysis, and this is all be my concluding uh, portion of the discussion. Uh, so, according to if you have three powers, you can. Uh, these are the four possible configurations that can, can exist between three powers. If you if you limit them to either positive or negative relations between each power, each so the, if you have three powers, you have uh, potentially three bilateral relationships between them. You can have a unit veto triangle in which everybody is opposed to each other. Everybody is opposed to each other. Second, you can have a stable marriage between two and the third. Or you can have a romantic triangle in which one power cultivates better relationships with the other two powers than they have with each other. And you can have a menage in which everybody has a good relationship with each other. These are the logical limits, I think, of a triangular relationship. So how does this work out for, ch for India and China and its relationship to China? Well, I think India has a double triangle. It has a small triangle, which is a local, tri I mean a regional triangle, which is, here you see, China, Pakistan, India. Uh, in other words, China has good relations with Pakistan, and both Pakistan and China have negative relationships with India. So that's basically a marriage, right? And the other, the larger global triangle is between US and India against China. Uh, that's the global triangle. Now this is, these are oversimplifications, of course, but when push comes to shove, uh, where are you gonna turn for security? That's the question. So who do you trust? Uh, so it's a double triangle. And it's not coincidental. These are some of the risks that are faced by India in this double triangle. There is a risk of a coalition between China, Pakistan, and the United States, as occurred between 1971 and 1989, basically, in which China and uh, Pakistan China was supporting Pakistan and the US was also supporting Pakistan. You remember the Kissinger visit to China? That was started by Pakistan. That was helped by Pakistan. Pakistan, he was staying in, pa he was, he was, he claimed he was staying in Pakistan while he, with a stomach ache while he was actually flying to, in, to China to arrange for Nixon's visit the next year. This was in 1971. So that, that is a coalition that would be dangerous for India because it puts China Pakistan and the US on the same side. A second is a coalition of China and Russia and Pakistan. Russia's relations with China may eclipse. You know that Russia and China, of course, are very good, on very good terms today. Russia and China are very tight today. Some people think it's, it's a, still a wary relationship, and I guess there is still some room for distrust there. But it's basically a very strong relationship in my own estimate. So uh, that's the second rich of a coalition between China, Russia, and Pakistan. In other words, the China-Russia relationship is still is very tight, and they both support Pakistan. Uh, so the obvious solution for India would be to cultivate relations with China, right? China would no longer need to threaten India's maritime hegemony if they had good, good relations with India. China and India could either coalesce, form a coalition, and cultivate good relations with the neighbors, of India's neighbors, or uh, China could try to move into a pivot position between India and its neighbors and manipulate them against each other. Uh, but anyway, it would be a better deal for China and India if they had good relations with each other. But unfortunately, that's not, in the, not on the cards, probably, because uh, the border border problem is one of the problems. That's there are two basic issues between India and China that are difficult, very difficult to overcome. As I, as I, in my estimation, I don't know. I I learned from you. One is the border issue, and the other is the uh, problem of asymmetry and uh, inequality. Uh, that India feels that China looks down on them. 
So it's a somewhat the same psychological problem that afflicted the Sino-Soviet relationship when they had the dispute. China felt that it, the Soviet Union looked down on it and it tried. It was the, it was the master master servant relationship. So those are the two issues. Uh, so uh, the in other words, the, these two triangles, in somewhat in some they balance each other. They balance each other in a sense. The these two triangles because. Uh, U.S. India counters China uh, Pakistan alliance. Uh, China Pakistan against India is threatening to India, so it forms an outside alliance with the U.S. And this was been this has been true since the Cold War. During the Cold War, it was the same dynamic, but with different actors. During the Cold War, it was the India-USSR alliance. The, the, the large triangle was the U.S. was China, <coughs> India, and the USSR counterbalancing the uh, China-Pakistan alliance in the regional regional area. So, the, uh, India has these two triangles that tr it tries to keep them balanced against each other, and the risk is that they. One of one of the other players in one of the two triangles forms a coalition against India, uh, but so far uh, that's why India has been moving towards. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that India has been moving towards the United States, is because uh, Russia has been moving towards Pakistan. I think Russia is moving uh, closer to Pakistan. Re nuclear suppliers group question right? Uh, Russia. Has not has supported Pakistan on that, as, uh, the, my, my information, uh, and other uh, such. So Russia is trying to move into a more balanced position to try to balance between India and Pakistan. I think so. Uh, that is some of the risks. Uh, let's see if I wanted to say anything, and I'll open up. This is 45 minutes exactly. Uh, well, I had a few things I wanted to say about the nuclear issue, but I can, I can talk about that later. Let me open it right now to questions on this, uh, on what I've said so far. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Dietmar. We'll give him a round of applause first. <laughs> when the uh, idea of inviting you um, to meet the research community here came up. Um, I had Sumit Ganguly as one of our visitors. Unfortunately, he has had to leave a bit earlier than planned, but still, we were able to get Professor Rajesh Pashur, whose article, uh, Nuclear Weapons and India's Strategic Culture, we also have in our book. And of course, Jivan Tashatli and I did the piece on uh, the new dynamics of India's foreign policy and its ambiguities. Um, the paper you gave today is actually a, a refinement of the paper that I published originally. Um, what had caught my attention then was choices, that countries have choices to make, and choices have costs and benefits, and some of their future moves could be anticipated. That uh, one could model international politics in terms of recursive games, and uh, three-person games, and so on. Um, that, that's what I said, that uh, we have someone who understand countries in terms of their political culture as well as in terms of the international relations theory and theory of games and choices. So thank you very much for joining us. We should uh, start the general discussion right away. Uh, may I take uh, the privilege of the chair to ask you uh, the first question. Stephen Cohen said fairly early that uh, there are two kinds of countries. There are status quo powers who are happy to live within the territories they are given and happy to live with other people if they are happy to live within their territories. So you do what you want, you pray whichever God in your house and I do the same. And India was or India is that kind of country. Then there are countries which are not status quo powers but ideological powers. They are, or they see themselves, as the purveyor of an idea. So their borders are negotiable, but not their visions. That was the 
differentiation that Stephen Cohen made, which is why he had made a prediction that both Pakistan and China are ideological powers. One is meant to protect Islam, the other is meant to protect the revolution, and India will only protect India's borders. So that was the Stephen Cohen prediction. Now let's see how things have changed. When Deng Xiaoping very happily announced that it doesn't matter what color your cat is, what matters is, is it catching mice? If getting rich is glorious, then we could all be one happy family, getting richer in our own ways, but not through war. So I thought at the time that the Stephen Cohen prediction had come to an end because India was following suit. And India and China started trading vigorously, which is how a new joke started. Uh, you have your way of describing India-China relations. The one that we are more familiar to hearing is Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai is how it starts, 1962. Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. And then, after the liberalization of India's economy, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. <laughs> Except there's a problem, as you said, of this big asymmetry. Oh, yeah. However, now I see that maybe Cohen was not so wrong after all that India and China could not settle down to an equilibrium or develop a stable marriage. They would have this problem still because India's borders, which India thought were stable, are not. They are a matter of construction. And the new government believes in something a bit like the Chinese that uh, India should reach out to the Indian diaspora, or India should have a presence not only in the Indian territory, but would spread out. And China, similarly, um, we have been thinking about uh, over is sold as a commercial idea, but underpinning it is a security intention. So we are back to where we were, a kind of intractable rivalry, which is what you are talking about. Now, you said that the string of pearls idea is something that could be dismissed. Is that really so? Isn't there an attempt by China to invest not only in Pakistan, but also in Bangladesh and in Sri Lanka, and generate a situation where India would have two choices, either shut up and join up, or continue fighting what the Chinese believe would be ultimately a losing war on the part of China, on the part of India. Would you see that argument that way? Yes, and a, a, a number of people have made that argument that I India should uh, join, actually should join the uh, uh, Maritime Silk Road, and that they would have certain benefits uh, from joining, that they should just uh, go ahead and join. Uh, and uh, I went to a talk just recently by Kanti Bajpai, I'm sure you know, who described the current uh, China-India relationship as the worst since the 1980s. And he blamed that on India, oh. on, uh, specifically on Modi. He blamed that on Modi. So that's very, that's very controversial right now, whether India, I mean, uh, the Americans sent a delegation uh, to the forum, to the uh, Silk Road forum. So the Silk Road has, be has really been an, uh, a leap of imagination, uh, uh, a vision, a visionary sort of project that has captured everybody's imagination. Uh, is it a mistake for India not to join? I don't think it's uh, in, uh, I don't think it's going, going to be a, I don't think China will succeed in a Silk Road, uh, maritime Silk Road, without India. So I think India has something that China wants and needs to have the Silk Road succeed. And so it might be just sort of a bargaining by Modi. What are you going to give us? I mean, if if we join, because uh, because China wants India in. Uh, so we'll have to see how that works out. I think it could be to, to India's advantage, economic, just looked at as a purely economic question to join it. Uh, I'm sure that's why Trump has uh, sent a delegation there. He doesn't have any sort of uh, ideological uh, affinity for China, certainly. 
so it might be to, to India's advantage in a purely commercial sense. Okay, thank you very much. We will now open questions. I would uh, take uh, three questions. Um, okay, I will recognize first our guests. Please introduce yourself and then ask a question. It will be the second one. And uh, we had a third guest. Okay, if not, then Sojin. You will be the third person. So we start with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Brandon Yoder. I'm at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, a couple questions. So um, you mentioned two issues that could lead to antagonism between China and India. Um, it seems to me that the Maritime Silk Road, which you were just talking about, uh, could be a, another really big issue, and I would say possibly primary, uh, because it's about this, it's the same thing that we see between the U.S. and China as a, as a primary issue, which is who's going to make the rules of the international order. So the Maritime Silk Road is China's one of one aspect of China's attempts to make uh, the rules of the regional economic order uh, and political order, and that would uh, be another form of encirclement. You were talking about military encirclement with with the, the string of pearls, uh, but this would be another kind of potential encirclement where China establishes. Uh, its ability to make and, re and enforce rules that may or may not be in in India's interest. The other um, uh, interesting question that I'm rolling around in my head, I study U.S.-China relations, and so I'm very interested theoretically in the effects of power transitions. China's always been the, the rising power, vis-a-vis -vis almost everyone. Um, but the, the, the data you were, you were talking about uh, shows that long term, even perhaps currently, India is rising vis-a-vis -vis China. And so the things that we've seen as staples in China's foreign policy, Taoguang Yanghui and then the recent assertive turn, uh, are, the, are characteristic of a rising power. Now, how do you think China's behavior will be different uh, when it's no longer the rising power in a relationship, but a declining power potentially vis-a-vis -vis India in the future? Thanks very much. Is it all right, Loyal? We'll take three questions and then, okay, you're the next person. Hang on, hang on. Would you introduce yourself first and then ask your question? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ninad Deshpande. I'm new Deputy High Commissioner of India in Singapore. Huh? I have good fortune of working in China and Bangladesh. In fact, I'm coming from Bangladesh to Singapore. Uh, I'm sorry I missed a, a great part of your speech. I reached a bit late. Uh, so you might have answered this. I'm not sure and sorry if you have already answered. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you think about the BCIM economic cooperation? That is Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar <coughs> economic cooperation, uh, which is a track 1.5 initiative going on since quite a few years. Second, what do you think about India's own sub-regional cooperation and connectivity project? Uh, like BBIN, like Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal uh, connectivity project. And what do you think of US role in uh, the uh, neighborhood of India, like US role in uh, Bangladesh, US role in Nepal, and US role in Sri Lanka, whether it will have some sort of uh, balancing, counterbalancing, or any sort of impression on what is happening on India-China relationship. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Despande. There's quite a few questions. So, Jini, adios. Then we'll get Professor Dietmar. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I would like to uh, raise the issue of uh, North Korea, uh, which is quite like a uh, like hot potato uh, in international security <laughs> nowadays. And the, um, the US and China, I mean, both uh, countries are trying to encircle their own gang over the issue, like India, the UK, um, I mean, not India, I mean, the US and the UK and Japan, they are in one circle, approaching the issue like uh, with the hotlines, while China and Pakistan and Russia, they are in other circle, uh, approaching the issue with more modest way. And um, I was wondering why India and Pakistan, I mean, including other South Asian countries are quite uh, quiet over the issue. Um, though we South Korean, we think that the source of um, the technology transfer for the ICBM uh, in, in North Korea is in fact China through Pakistan. And um, I am wondering uh, about your take on this issue um, by using probably you know double triangular um, the position, the analysis over this issue. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Over to you, Loel. 
I'm not sure I understood that last question. Uh, I, yeah, could you repeat your question, Par? Yeah, could you, um, could you uh, describe or could you um, like explain the North Korea issue by using your, you know, the four models? Ah. Four models like India, Pakistan, U.S., um, in North Korea, like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, the North okay. Korea is a uh, very, very complicated issue, uh, and uh, the, it's complicated by two things, of course. One thing is the nuclear issue, and the other thing is that it's a divided nation, and Kim Jong-un's, one of his top priorities is to unify Korea, right? So th those two issues are very, I mean, how, they, how those two issues interact is uh, is uh, the key to the dynamic between North uh, between and the North Korean issue, I but think. India and Pakistan have been very quiet, and they have not really expressed uh, about that issue. And, um, about the North Korean issue. Yes. Ah. Well, there's another dimension uh, besides the triangular dimension, which is the distribution of technology, distribution of knowledge. And that is not triangular. That's sort of more hierarchical, depending on the level of technology that you reach. And that's sort of more, and so that creates a sort of patron-client relationship between countries. So in this sort of level of, in this technology distribution, you'd have the United States at the top, and then Russia, then China, then India, then Pakistan, something like that. Well, uh, we will take it up afterwards. Um, the question uh, Dr. Sojin has asked yeah. uh, is a question that I also used to get because I use your material for my lectures. Yeah. So how about if there are four players? Can you use a triangle? There my solution was four players can be broken into two different triangles right. which are entangled. Uh -huh. so that you can be playing off one triangle against another. Uh -huh. Like Nepal is uh, playing off India and China, and uh, India is hoping to play off China and the United States, and Pakistan is of course playing off uh, India and China. So they are all triangulating, mm -hmm. so the world can be thought of in terms of a cascade of triangles mm -hmm. connecting co one another. All along one is asking for a country, what are the alternatives and what are the costs and benefits of each alternative and which are to go, what are the unintended consequences. That's how I used to answer my students using your material, but today you're the speaker, so you have to take questions. We have got uh, these two questions to tackle oh, yes, before I, we I, move I on to other people. Other questions. Uh, let's see, what, was <coughs> what, what about when China is a declining power? That gets uh, sort of a, that's the day after tomorrow. I mean, I t that's not even tomorrow, that's the day after tomorrow, right? I think the, the question that the world will have to deal with for a while, I think, is when China is number one, before it, before it starts to decline. It's because that's its goal. It wants to become number one. It wants to uh, become the leading country in the world. I think that's, that's, it holds the United States as the object, catching up with the United States has been its goal since Mao since Mao enunciated goal, that goal way back in 1957. So that's its number one goal. So what, are we gonna, what is the world going to do when China is number one? I think that's the, that's the question we have to ask first. Then the day after tomorrow, we have to ask the question when China de starts declining. I think that comes later. So how do you deal with China as number one? Because China has already become more confident, more assertive and so forth now. Uh, when it is actually overtakes the United States in terms of GDP, it will become still more confident and more assertive, I think. So what will it do, and, what, uh, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we prepare for that? How does the rest of the world prepare for that? Uh, the other question, let's see. Uh, U.S. role in Bangladesh and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I think that right now we're at a sort of strange point in, in our <laughs> in our political, in our politics, in our domestic politics, we've elected a novice essentially to for to the presidency, 
uh, I'm not saying he's stupid or that he's, I mean, certainly he's not very, he's not very courteous. But, I mean, he's not very uh, polite and so forth. That's no question about it. He takes the language of the street to, to the politics. And so, but he's not formulated a, a strategy. He doesn't have a strategy yet, or at least one that he's been prepared to, re to reveal. Uh, he makes a virtue of not having a strategy. He says, well, I'm going to surprise everybody. That's part of his negotiating style. I'm going to surprise everyone. So we don't know exactly what his policy will be towards the South, China, South Asia. Uh, but there, is, there are two tendencies. Uh, one is the uh, mercantilist tendency. I think that's very strong in a former businessman. Uh, he wants to make as much money as he can. He wants to, to change the uh, trade imbalance. With that. So that's a basic bottom line question that he uses just across the board. Any country, if you've got a trade imbalance with us, we're going to fight you. We're going to try to impose uh, tariffs and so forth. Uh, so that's one criterion that he has. The second is realism. In other words, America is not number one anymore. We have to win. We have to sort of win, win, win. So a combination of mercantilism and realism. And third is traditional republicanism. Traditional republicanism means we adhere to our whatever said before. We keep up, keep up the traditions. So uh, people like McMaster and and uh, and Mattis have been pushing him toward a toward a traditional Republican. They're heads of the National Security Council. So I think there's strong pressure for him to become more traditional Republican. But he has his own uh, impulsive uh, personality, and he he rebels against that. He think why should we keep playing a losing game? That's his uh, sort of perspective. So it's going to be a struggle uh, between those two. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll now open the second round. Um, I already have Anish Mishra. Anyone else? OK, Professor Bollard. Anyway, Anish, you get started. Then you'll be followed. Good afternoon, Professor. My name is Anish Mishra. Um, thank you very much for the, for the fantastic presentation. Okay, um, one observation that I've made is that even if we see in both the world order, the present world order and the previous world order, for some reason, I don't know why India chooses to always bust under the Sunset Empire. Anyway, okay, com coming to my questions, my question is related to China, Russia, and the United States. I observed a few months back when, um, when the United States actually attacked the base of... Um, of a, 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 Assad in, in uh, Syria, the one that actually where they launched the chemical attacks, actually I was very happy on that day because the things that, uh, my, my, uh, my view is that a severing of relations between US and Russia is actually excellent for the Afro-Asian world minus India because relations between um, US and Russia, the objective of that relation would actually be meant to contain the rise of China. On, 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 on the other hand, just a few days back, I think less than four or five days ago, Xi Jinping actually went to Russia and actually signed $10 billion of, um, of, of trade deals. So the thing is that, how do you think India will, will be affected between the relations, the, by the relations of China and Russia? Not only India, but as well as the Afro-Asia world. And if you look at Pakistan, actually, um, to the credit of Pakistan, Pakistan has actually um, improved its relations with Moscow a lot. Just, uh, I think, less than a year ago, there was actually a, a military operation between Russia and Pakistan in Gilgit, Baltistan, which is, you know, in part of, of mm -hmm. Pakistan. So, just, uh, I, want, I, I would like your opinion on this uh, China, Russia, U US thing. I mean, uh, um, you know, Zulfika Ali Bhutto actually wrote in his book Myth of Independence that you know throughout the history of the world there is only going to be three powers, which is China, Russia, and U.S. And it's only a play between the three of them. Now, my my, my second question is that um, I would like to know how can India actually strengthen its position vis-a-vis -vis China. Personally, I believe that the, the current state of relation between India and China is actually a great foreign policy failure on the part of India. So, the, the, for the question, the second question is this, how can India strengthen its position with China and also, uh, you know, how can there be a, a, a breakthrough in, in, in Sino-Indian relations? And my third and last question is, okay, we talk about one belt, one road. I've also made some observations on this and I genuinely believe, right, that actually there can be two belts and many roads. India actually has has the, the the ability to make another belt and road, and this will actually connect through Southeast Southeast Asia, and it will also help ASEAN countries to balance China. But the problem of, the problem with this is that India we don't have that same kind of um, they, they don't have the same kind of check checkbook diplomacy that China has, which has actually bought them you know 
uh, our corrupt South Asian leaders. So with this, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I like your view on these things. And if you can't ask questions and answer them as well, <laughs> uh, we will give the speaker a chance. Professor Bollard. Oh, thank you. I'm Alan Bollard from APIC, just in the building, next one up along the road. Uh, to put a bit of an economic slant on this, uh, the, uh, and, and the question about um, if China's dominant and India's not dominant, of course, one of the models that we've seen with China and the United States is that China has always threatened the United States' competitive position. We do hear China um, worried about its growing cost structure, but we tend to hear about it being worried because Vietnam, Bangladesh, Myanmar are all much cheaper producers. I haven't heard them saying we're worried about competition from India. I'm interested as to whether you think that could be a prospect. And in that context... Could be a what? A prospect, possibility. Oh. And in that context, uh, you also haven't mentioned the current trade negotiation underway in this region, which is quite unusual for the East Asia Pacific because it has India in it. So I'm talking about regional comprehensive economic partnership with India and China negotiating at the minute. And just how significant that could be, although, of course, that's only inching its way to resolution at the moment. Okay. Um, Jivanta Shatley. Oh. Thank you very much, Professor Ditma. I was just looking at your abstract, and in that you have a word here which hasn't come up so far in the presentation, that of nationalism. And then I was thinking the counter to nationalism being globalization, which also hasn't featured in the talk. So in your analysis, can globalization still hold these three countries uh, together and prevent nationalism from getting out of control? Or are you also one of those who believes we're entering a phase of deglobalization? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. First, uh, let me uh, respond to you on the Russia, Russia question. Actually, Russia is, uh, I think, very close to China. And it has uh, very few other options, I think, right now. Uh, Russia is uh, a, a militarily strong and technologically relatively advanced country that has fallen in uh, economically in, 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 in it's, it's, it's a smaller economy than India. Did you know that? It's a smaller economy than India in terms of GDP. So they have, they're more, more advanced and certainly in weapons building and some of the things. Uh, but they've, uh, they're basically, their ex major export is commodity, commodity petroleum. Uh, so they're a petrol, petrol state, a huge petrol state. So uh, that, that restrains their, I think that restrains their, their possibilities. They still have a strong military, but uh, so what can they do? I mean, they, they want to reclaim their the Eastern, Eastern European countries that were part of, I mean, certainly the ones that were part of the Soviet Union before. Ukraine, Georgia, they would really like to keep those in their sphere of influence. And so that's the sort of bottom line for them. Uh, and China's gone along with that. And, 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 and in, re in return, Russia supports China's claims on the South China Sea. They did at the recent conference of the, of the, of the uh, G20. They, they, uh, Putin explicitly supported uh, and, he, and sort of denounced the PCA verdict. So they've been collaborating. Uh, and whether this collaboration, well, I think, it, I think it'll also include Pakistan because Pakistan and Gwadar are going, part of the thing is to go, to link the Silk Road, Maritime Silk Road with the Silk Road economic road through Central Asia. So that's what Gwadar represents because they'll build a railway and so forth up through Kashmir and so forth, up to Xinjiang, and Russia hopes to link that through its Eurasian, Eurasian Union uh, to, the, uh, to Pakistan. So that will build co co cooperation between China and Russia, and between China, Russia, and Pakistan. 
And that's one of the problems that uh, Modi has with the Silk Road. It's because it goes through Kashmir, of course, which, which India claims. So that's a very, uh, very, very sensitive. He can't very well support uh, the Gwadar project. So that's on, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. What? Only the first question. What was the second one? <laughs> the question, the second question is how can India strengthen its position against China and how do you think can there be a breakthrough in China and India? How can India strengthen its position against China? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, if they had better sort of uh, results in their border talks, that would be one <laughs> area that would be. But they've been negotiating about 17 years on their border, and they haven't. Uh, they've found that issue very difficult to resolve. So, I, uh, they could join the Silk Road. That would be one. <laughs> um, that would make China. That would make China very happy. They did that. Uh, they. Um, if you think that be before 2014, when, when was Modi was elected in 2014, if you think India's relations with China were better before 2014, see, what Modi is, is no question he's aggravated the relationship. I think he's made the India-China relationship worse than it was before he came to power. How has he done that? He didn't join the Silk Road. And he's building all the, these different various routes and so forth to compete with China. He doesn't join the Silk Road. He builds his own Silk Roads the BCIM corridor, all these different corridors that India has been building. Uh, the, the, I, I, I have them in my paper, and, but I can't remember all of them all, but they, uh, India is trying to compete with China. So if they were to try to sort of cooperate with China in some of these uh, projects, that would certainly help relations. But this is basically, Modi's decided that the relationship is basically competitive and he's going to compete. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I think that's what he's decided. I could be wrong. Uh, so that's where it is, I think. Yeah. Uh, on the first question, you answer there. The, sovereign, the sovereign of US Russia relations, would it be excellent for the Afro Asia world minus India? Solving of the US relations yes, with uh, Russia. The sovereign of relations between US and Russia, is that good for the Afro Asia world minus India? Well, certainly I think that, uh, I mean, it's impossible, of course, because uh, the news media are, are criticizing Trump for uh, having cooperated with Russia to win his election. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's a sort of a basic, basic problem for him. He can't go very close to Russia. I mean, he's, he's meeting with Putin, I guess, today. But uh, whether and everybody's watching that, what he'll do. But uh, everybody suspects, I mean, the news media, of course, suspect him of having co cooperated with Russia to win the election, the American presidential election. So there is not much room for him to cooperate. But if he could cooperate with Russia, it would certainly be good. I mean, I think it would, if he could at least talk with Russia, if he could solve the Ukraine question. Uh, of course, if they solve the Ukraine question, you've got to have Ukraine agree to the solution. So you've got to have somebody in, in power in Ukraine that agrees with the with the state of the affairs between Russia and Ukraine, so if he could if he could do that, if he could if he could solve that, that would I mean certainly the Europeans would be very happy because they're tired of the sanctions too. I mean, it, it hurts them economically too. The, I mean, Russia has counter sanctions against Europe. Europe has sanctions against them. And do you think you could uh, take the other two questions because we'll still have one more round? Right, right. Okay. There's another question. You I think globalization and nationalism. Globalization and nationalism. Globalization, I think, will continue. Uh, certainly, I think it's going to be hard to to stop trade and so forth. But there has been a rise of nationalism. Uh, not only Trump, but in a way, Macron is uh, very nationalistic. Although he's a globalist too. So you can. It's not either or. You can have globaliz globalism and nationalism at the same time. Many of uh, Trump has chosen to emphasize a nationalistic sort of uh, element, sort of anti-trade and so forth but you can but there has been there have been these I think Trump in a way is like Xi Jinping you know you know it's sort of uh, in his nationalism in, in, in that respect I mean not not like him in any other way but he's very nationalistic make America great again and all that sort of thing okay. and you had a question from uh, Dr. Bollard 
about okay. the South Asian dimension. About the what? The, the, would you like to repeat your question? Regional partnership between India and China, or between negotiations that are underway currently, which is quite a departure for India on ASEAN regional comprehensive regional partnership. I haven't followed those. I, I, are they with India's neighbors, or no, with, with, neighbors. with China? Well, ASEAN plus plus. ASEAN plus plus. I see the RCEP. Yeah, RC the RCEP. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, my my view of that is somewhat pessimistic. I, China, Ch India has been very very difficult to negotiate these multilateral agreements. Mm. I mean they've they've taken a long time to do it, and they find a lot of problems with them. So they've taken a long. <laughs> if you include India in the negotiations, it's going to slow things down. I think. <laughs> Am I wrong? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think it may take some time to negotiate that. But that certainly, since the TPP collapsed, yes. RCEP is going to be uh, one alternative. Now, they're trying to get the T T TPP alive. They're trying to keep it alive. I mean, Japan wants to keep it alive. Uh, Australia wants to keep it alive. So the TPP might, might, be, uh, might be alive without US in it. That's, a, that's one option. TPP hasn't collapsed. Right. Yeah, right. US withdrew. That's right. So they're trying to keep it alive, yeah. I was uh, only recently in Delhi for the Delhi dialogue uh -huh. between India and uh, the ASEAN countries. And there the betting was that the loss of TPP is the gain of the RCEP. And uh, they are still hoping to get something out of it. I mean, that's the thinking in the Southeast Asian states. Good. We will now have the last round. Um, yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yasin Anwar, I'm advisor to the Industrial Commercial Bank of China. I come from the same economic background for, from our fraternity as Alan Bollard, so we've known each other for a while at the Central Bank Fraternity. Uh, I'd like to make an economic observation. I'm going to leave the political angle to the experts, so I'm going to stay out of that. Uh, but from an economic point of view, uh, incidentally, the uh, G, uh, Xi Jinping's conference in May uh, renamed all these acronyms of OBOR and Maritime Silk Road. It's now referred to as Belt Road BRI. Initiative, BRI. So that's what everybody can, uh, refers to it as. Um, the hist I look at it from a historical perspective, that um, since the global financial crisis, we've had a g landscape change dramatically from the economic shift of power. And um, over the last 70 years, the United States has been the leading economic power and the leader in many ways. Um, that shift has taken place with the result of the elections as well as the shift in economic power. The economic responsibility or the role of Europe has also had serious problems, and it's still continuing to so. China, if you look at 1982 to 2016, the global GDP growth rates were 3.7 percent. If you strip out China, it was 2.5 percent. That gives you a magnitude of how the rising uh, economic role of China has been. China is today uh, one of the two largest economic uh, in terms of GDP and probably will uh, grow in the next year or two to surpass the United States as well. Uh, today, OECD countries represent about 65% of the global GDP. By 2050, it is expected the number will be reversed with emerging markets, mainly India and China, to take on that dominant role. That's the way the projections show at uh, current time. Same things happened with the reserve allocations, has shifted also from 15 years ago for 65% with the developing country, developed countries to now the emerging markets because of India, China, Malaysia, and other countries have most of the international reserves. Um, now, the Belt Road Initiative, I look at it from an economic perspective. China obviously has to have access to these imports, commodity resources, to ensure its own survival and growth. The oil represents a major commodity, and right now, by 2090, it is uh, reputed that 90% of the Middle East oil will flow into Asia because of the Asian growth rates. That's, that's a statistic that some analysts have come up and shown. 40% of the trade, global trade, goes through Indian Ocean right now. And about 5.4 trillion of trade goes through the South China Sea, of which 2.3 trillion, uh, 2 point, uh, 2 point, uh, 24 percent is U.S. trade, and large bulk in China as well. So all this economic linkages the BRI initiative creates, from my perspective as an economic economic manager, uh, is to try and consolidate its economic import of economic resources that it needs for its own future, and also in terms of this incentive it needs to build infrastructure. That's the whole 
effort that supports this. With $2.2 trillion of BRI initiative, uh, Pakistan represents a very small component. Uh, I, I think that's a subject that, uh, to me, it's a very small component of the larger BRI initiative that goes to Lithuania, Mediterranean, and other parts of the ASEAN region. And um, with urbanization with only about 45% in the ASEAN region, with international standard of about 60%, this is expected by 2050 to reach the 60% standard because of infrastructure. Infrastructure is the engine of growth, and therefore that will stimulate the growth that's needed to get the whole global economy back on its feet. That's the way I look at it, and with Europe, as I mentioned, and sluggish growth in the United States, and the existential death crisis in the uh, European area where aus severe austerity measures are still in play, it's going to take ages for them to get out of it. This represents Asia growth model, India, ASEAN region, China, represent the stimulant that's necessary for infrastructure and in turn the SME and other sectors. This, so this BRI initiative linkage, linkages with all these uh, points are designed to create connectivity. And if, in my opinion, I think all countries can benefit from it. Uh, not only uh, China, but also all countries connected with that. They have low infrastructure, and that's what's needed to stimulate growth in each of these. I'm sorry, I didn't ask a question. It's gone long-winded, but that's the way I look at it from an economic point of view, not from a political point of view. I think everybody can benefit. Well, thanks very much. You're ruling out anxiety and fear well, as the right. issues that matter. We'll have a second question here. Okay, Professor Bashur. I'm Rajesh Basru from the Rajaratnam School in Singapore. Uh, just uh, one very precise question, and that is uh, with regard to the India-China border. Um, uh, <clears throat> for some time now, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Modi, the Indian government, have been dim have been uh, calling for a settlement of the line of actual control, which is uh, which is supposed to demarcate the border between the two forces. And uh, to the extent that uh, Modi, you know, publicly declared that uh, whatever settlement is there for the LAC will not have a bearing on the final border settlement. So that sort of objection was uh, ruled out. Uh, but we still don't understand really why is it that Beijing is uh, completely reluctant to negotiate on the formalization of the LAC. So I was wondering if you, as a China specialist, might have a view from that side. Thanks very much. Uh, Is and there? And, uh, oh, no, you were sorry. Finished, sorry. Are we running out of time? I, I, I can stop there. Um, no, no. I mean, please okay. go ahead. Okay. The second one is really, you know, when you look at these three, India, China, and the United States, uh, China has uh, uh, significant strategic frictions with both the US and with India. But uh, you know, there's a paradox here because if you look at the economic picture, regardless of the trade balance, okay, there is a huge amount of uh, investment and growing investment. I just looked at the figures from the US trade representative a uh, couple of days back. And Chinese investment FDI in the US uh, between 2014 and 2015 grew by 50.6 percent in just mm -hmm. one year. Yeah. Uh, simultaneously, uh, Chinese investment in India, uh, I think in 2015, uh, was bigger than the last decade. So there's something happening here, and there seems to be a disjuncture between the way we think about the strategic relationship and both are investing, I mean, these countries are cross-investing. U.S. investment is 75 billion in China. So I think, I wonder, is it that, are these two countries thinking schizophrenically, or are we as analysts thinking schizophrenically? Mm. Excellent. Are there any further questions? Okay, over to you. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 I appreciate your comment. I, think, I hope you're right, that the, uh, there is no, nothing to worry about in terms of the Belt Road uh, BRI. Uh, that th it makes it improves infrastructure and the, the, the developing world needs that. So fine, let's go ahead. So fine, uh, we'll see. Uh, but there are always pol political implications whenever it happens. So you have to pay attention to the politics as well. Uh, on the other questions here, why China objects to the LAC? I'm not an expert on the, these are very, very um, 
very, as you say, it's a very precise question. Uh, and I'm not an expert on the, but I think one of the factors here is uh, certainly on Arunachal Pradesh is that uh, they want Dawang because uh, the Dalai Lama came from Dawang before. Uh, they had taken Dalai Lamas from there. And so th if the Dalai Lama passes away or if he, th they, they're afraid that he would go back there. I think, I don't know how this works, but he would go back there and find his successor or something like that. And they wouldn't be able to control it. Because they, they look forward to his death so they can control, finally, the Tibet. Because they consider Tib Dalai Lama the seed of the opposition to, to their control of Tibet. So I think it has to do with that. Uh, I'd, I'd appreciate other comments or any insights into that. I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I think that might be one factor. That they, they want Dawang and so on. That, and, and India has to have that as a very narrow corridor between the part of India that's on the, in the far far eastern part, and, the, and the, yes. so India has to is very sensitive about that. Uh, on the uh, why, let's see, China, Chinese investment in the U.S. Oh, China, <laughs> yes, right, very good question. Why is uh, China's investing in the U.S. Money is fleeing China. Money is leaving China. They can't control it. It's partly the stock market crash in 2014. And so, uh, and partly they're going out initiative. So they've drawn down. They have used to have about four trillion dollars in reserves. And now they have about three three trillion. So about a three trillion dollars has left China. So they, I mean, the cost of labor in China is quite high now. It's gone up. They're they're paying their workers more. The factories would like to invest. I mean, they're just like Japan or Germany or anybody else, uh, offshoring. Let's put it somewhere else where they can, we can make this stuff cheaper. So the factories sometimes go abroad, and then this Belt Road Initiative (BRI). Uh, Belt, Belt Road Initiative is a bunch of things, really, and some are came before the Belt Road Initiative, and some come after. And they're sort of a, pulling them, pulling them all together in one big package. It's calling a one thing. It's a brilliant idea in terms of PR, p public relations, but it's not all, the, all that coherent how it's going to go. I mean, it's, there's no clear plan. There's no agency in Beijing that's coordinating everything. They're trying to pull, it, pull all these things together. They're very, very diverse things. So China's investing in the U.S. The U.S. is going to start monitoring that. The, Ameri the Congress is very, very a leery of uh, Chinese investment. They think security might be in danger and so forth. And the U.S. is in investing in India. And I'm not sure it makes any sense uh, in terms of strategic logic. Uh, when Western countries invest abroad, they do it, you know, the companies do it on their own logic, right? China tries to have a more corporatist approach. The, the state makes the decisions. They decide we're going to but they're losing, the, I think they're losing control of their economy to some extent as well. So they don't really, they can't really control as, as well as they could before where the investment goes. But certainly they've been the world's greatest savers for the last 30 years. They have this huge stockpile of money. What are they going to do with it? They can't invest it domestically or it'll cause inflation. So they have to, I mean, they can, they can take it abroad. That's, when, that's, when they, that's a logical thing to do. And uh, U.S. investment in India, well, India is growing fast. I mean, India is probably a good investment, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh. Okay, um, I'm going to have to bring the formal part of the conversation to an end. But please stay on, have a cup of tea or whatever, and have a, continuous, uh, have a continuity of your conversation. Um, ISAS is very pleased to see all of you in the middle of a working day, and we are not well connected in terms of the transport. So the fact that people come is for us a great source of confidence that what we are offering to Singapore uh, makes sense. And what we offer by the way of conversation, we then put on the shelf by the way of publication. And I'll be looking towards Professor Dietmar to make this conversation memorable by um, looking at the notes that have been taken from this conversation, and I hope to publish them or publish some of it in a version that you approve of. and will be happy then to offer them to the audience. But a couple of things that emerged today, 
uh, will stay with me for a long time. And Rajesh, thank you very much for asking quite uh, clearly, where is the ambiguity? Is it in the behavior of countries or is it in the minds of the analysts? Because countries are quite able to live with contradictions. Like I was yesterday, a day before, in Delhi for the Delhi Dialogue. I was uh, amazed to see in India newspapers the Ministry of Home Affairs being asked. Now that there's a problem in the north, are, uh, is the ministry restricting the entry of Chinese companies to the Indian market? To which the ministry said, no way. I mean, business is business, politics is politics. We uh, want to continue the business and we'll sort out the politics another way. Or in other words, um, uh, India and China are quite able to continue a sweet and sour relationship, like in the uh, kitchen, that uh, conversation can go on, so can trade. If they don't have a problem, why do we have a problem? Because we as analysts must look for clarity, not fudginess. And to use your language, uh, Lowell, um, there probably are no stable marriages. Every partner in a stable marriage um, is a little worried about the possibility of a bit on the side. So we go back to uh, Cautilla, and Cautilla, the reason I'm saying it is because I've written a book on it, and that's the gift that uh, Professor Dietmar is going to get. And Cautilla says, to begin with, you must assume that your neighbors will be your Ari, will be your enemies. But the neighbor's neighbor might become a Mitra, uh, which is my name, uh, might become a friend. So these are the givens, but they are not mechanical givens. You can play with it. So geopolitics would be to know what you have and then decide what are you going to do with what you have. The combination will make policy and uh, that is what will open up the choices that uh, countries have. So uh, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation and uh, for uh, continuing the conversation with members of the audience. Um, and probably someone will ask a question about Tibet, because I jumped when I saw on your uh, uh, PowerPoint that India recognized uh, Chinese sovereignty in Tibet only in 2008. I don't know if it was a typo, or if it was really like that, or whether India has a Tibetan policy at all, and do the Americans have a Tibetan policy, and how does Tibet factor into this triangular relationship of China, the United States, and India. Anyway, those are issues that uh, we will continue to talk about. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, let's give him an applause.